Welcome to Kairos. My name is Danny Householder. I'm the campus minister at Hope Ames. And so I get to hang out at Kairos too. Hi, my name is Haley Shepherds, and I'm the pastoral intern here at Kairos. And we just want to welcome you. Uh, we know that it's no accident that you're here. We're so excited to worship with you today. So whether you're at home, whether you're with family or friends, go ahead and stand up and we're going to worship together. Stand wherever you are tonight. We sing these songs together. In many locations tonight. We lift our voice to the same God. We sing this out together. So just one word. What just one word? You call the storm that surrounds me. What just one word? The darkness has to retreat. Oh, just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Oh, just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, just one word. You hear what's broken inside me. In just one word. And you revive every dream. Oh, yes, you do. Oh, just one touch.
song, we make this our prayer. We know that our God is with us no matter what we're facing. We sing this out. You are matchless in grace and mercy. There's no way we can hide from your love. You are steadfast, never failing. You are faithful. All creation is in all of who you are. You're the healer. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. We pray. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King, our Savior forever. For eternity, we will sing of all you. Where there was death, you brought life, the Lord. Sing it, 
force, nothing can come against, no one can stay between. God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stay between us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for that truth that we just sang. God, that you are with us. Even in these uncertain times where we don't know what's going to come up next, what our future holds, God, we know that you're with us. We know that you hold your, the future in your hands. So God, we look to you tonight. We look to you for guidance. We look to you as our rock, as our stronghold. So God, we cast our care at your feet tonight. We thank you so much that even as we join together in many different places, that you're the same God who meets us every single place that we are. And we thank you for meeting us in this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Join me in opening your Bible, your Bible app, to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything has happened to me here has helped me spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak of God's message without fear. Here ends our reading. Our cat does not like the fact that we're all home quarantined. She's like, why are you in my house? Sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. I tell you what, isolation is hard, isn't it? Uh, again, my name is Danny. I'm the campus minister here at Hope Ames. And it's just good to be with you tonight, even if we're doing it. Uh, through a lens. I'm all right with that. So, uh, hey, we are hopping into a brand new series, and it's called Isolated. And for some people, isolation is not so bad. Uh, think about it for introverts. People are feeling like, this is the way that I always wanted my life to work. But then I really feel bad for a particular group of, uh, of beings out there, and those are the dogs. Uh, the dogs out there who just want to be loved, and they just want to be cared for, they're not getting the same amount of pets that they used to get. They're not getting the same amount of hugs. And I wonder if they're like, why don't you love me anymore? Why aren't you hugging me? Well, we don't want to get our dogs sick either, right? But there's a group that I really feel bad for, and that is those introverted cats who are thinking, why in the world are these humans ruining my day and showing up in my life? I cannot get away from them and trying to meow them off. I'll tell you what, isolation is kind of weird. How's the isolation working for you? It's our series that we're talking about. And I want to talk to you about this, and I think it's really important to talk about it because we're all in a place that we didn't, did not necessarily expect to be in. Maybe it's a place that you didn't want to be in. And what do you do when you get to that place you didn't want to be? Can you grow? During the series called Isolated, we're talking about how you can grow in your faith and how you can grow as a person even when you are in the places you don't want to be. You heard about this in our reading. There's a guy named Paul. Check this out on the next slide here. It says this, everything that has happened to me here. Paul is saying everything that's happened to me here. If we skip forward two slides, he describes what here is. This says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Paul's talking about a time that he was in prison. 
And that's when he's writing this letter to the Philippians, and he's describing it in 2 Corinthians. He says, we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. I wonder if Paul was asking the question, how did I get here? Maybe we're all asking the question tonight, how did we get here? I think about it, three weeks ago, this room was jam-packed. Like 300 students in here. In our Iowa City location, you Cairo students uh, filling a room there with 50 plus of you. And now tonight we're spread out all over the place. You're home. I want to tell you this, my heart especially goes out to you, those of you who are seniors. I used to joke with people when I had first graduated from college that graduating from college was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I'll tell you what, I meant it. I'm like, this is terrible. But I want to tell you this, and I hope this gives you some confidence and assurance moving forward. Life is way better after college. It is. It might take a couple months to realize that, but it is better. And you'll eventually find that. But for today, I, I don't know that that necessarily helps. Maybe today you're just asking yourself that question. How do we get here? This isn't what I expected to be doing. I'll tell you what, my week has been full of things that I didn't expect to be doing. I never expected to be apologizing for coughing as much as I've been apologizing for coughing lately. Now, if I was really sick and it was a cough that was happening because I was sick, like, don't get me wrong, I'd stay inside and I'd go see a doctor. But I was having a conversation with someone the other day, I took a swig of water and it went down the wrong tube. You ever had this before? It goes down the wrong tube and of course, I'm choking. I'm suffering for life. And I cannot get air out. And so between coughs, I'm like, uh, I, uh, I am so sorry. I'm sorry. And the person who I'm talking to says to me, oh, I totally know what you mean. I smoke a pack of cigarettes every day. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, like, she has to apologize all the time for how much she's coughing right now, which frankly probably has actually nothing to do with that part of her health. We're doing things that we didn't expect. I was in Target last week. And... Uh, and I saw this. I was in Target because I actually needed toilet paper. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know that right now we are all at a shortage for toilet paper. And I get to the toilet paper aisle and I took this picture because there is one, one pack of toilet paper left. And I stood there for 10 minutes, I mean at least 10 minutes, thinking, am I going to do this? I mean, there are families out there. And after thinking for a while, I picked it up and I started walking with my 27 rolls of Scott's toilet paper. And as advertised on the package, every single roll has 1,000 sheets. And so I have 27,000 sheets of toilet paper that I'm walking through Target. That's all I have. I have never felt so judged in my entire life. And I'm looking at people. I never thought that I'd be doing this. I never thought that I would look people in the eye. They would see me with toilet paper and I would just have to look down at the ground dejected, feeling like I was ruining the world. And so I get to the cashier, and, and then it, 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 there's only one cashier. This poor cashier working at Target is trying her best, trying her best. The line's getting longer and longer. I'm standing there with toilet paper. We get to the front, and I decide, okay, well, I'm going to have to apologize now for buying this toilet paper. So I said, I just want you to know I really do need this. That came out wrong, because when you tell someone, hey, I really do need this, and you have toilet paper in your hand, that... Out of context, that's terrible, but of course she knew what I meant, and there's this line behind me. And then she said something that really caught me off guard. She said, oh, you're in luck. I said, well, that's, that's, that's right, because there was only one pack left. She goes, yeah, someone just returned these. Now, I don't know about you, but if you find out that you're buying used toilet paper, what would you do? And so what I did is I looked her in the eye and I said, I'm so sorry, I can't buy this. And I walked away empty-handed with a line of maybe a dozen people behind me, not practicing social distancing, by the way, watching me walk away empty-handed because I refused to buy used toilet paper. We're doing things that maybe we didn't expect, and it's, it's hard these times. Sure, it's hard. I had no idea how much I loved touching my face until the last couple of weeks. I keep on catching myself, like, mm, don't, don't, don't you do it, you know? You just fight yourself on it. What do we do? Can we grow? Take a look at what Paul says as he continues that passage in 2 Corinthians when he's describing where he's writing from when he's writing to the, Phil to the Philippians. Paul says, in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. And we learned only to rely on God, 
who raises the dead. And he did rescue us. And he will rescue us again. Paul is a man living in prison, talking like he has the hope of the world in his hands. Where does he get this from? Let's talk about who Paul is. Paul was a church planner. He's an evangelist. All he knows is telling people about Christ. He's got a tent business on the side to help fund his ministry. But what he's really passionate about is telling people about a God who's come to meet them in the same way that God met him. And now Paul's in prison. His career has been ripped away from him. He's a church planner. And he's in prison. This would be like a pianist having their hands tied behind their backs. Paul's had everything taken away. Not to mention, based on the context that we get from the story, Paul is probably handcuffed and chained to a prison guard the entire time he's there. There are probably prison guards who are going on shifts, maybe two or three a day, who are just chained to Paul. Paul can't do anything in privacy. He can't use the restroom alone. He can't sleep alone. He can't eat alone. He's in prison. He's isolated. But it's even kind of worse for him. Paul's not in a good spot, but he's talking like he has hope. You see, they took everything from Paul, except one thing. Ironically, when these people who thought, we need to get Paul out of here, and so in order to get Paul out of here, we'll take everything away from him, they accidentally helped him find the one thing they could never take. And Paul starts to realize what his foundation is built on. What's your foundation built on? You know, if I sit here and I say my life is falling apart because my career has gone away, my life is built on my career. If I sit here and I say my life is falling apart because I don't have my friends, my life was built on my friends. If I sit here and I say my life is falling apart because I'm sick, my life is built on my health. And these are all things that can be taken away from us. Nothing could be done that would take God away from Paul. Paul met Christ. And once Christ got his hands on Paul, no one would take them apart from each other. No one. Not even two or three prison guards a day. You see, there's something beautiful about the experience that Paul had in the prison. He saw what God is really in the business of doing. God doesn't stop. In the ancient world, there was this philosophy, it was called alchemy, and um, it continued for centuries and centuries, even over a thousand years. It was this idea that if you manipulated a material enough, you could turn even a worthless material, something like lead, into gold. And so you had alchemists, and they would take worthless material and do whatever they could, try to manipulate it. And maybe sometimes they could manipulate the people around them and think, see, I really turned this into something cool. I turned it into gold. It was this belief that you could turn nothing into something of value. And Paul is sitting there and he's realizing things have been turned into things of value. Things that seemed worthless have been turned into things of value. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, he continues on and he says, Look, I want you to know that everything that's happened to me here has helped spread the good news. He says, This whole place, all of the palace guards, they know that I'm in chains because of Christ. Isn't that cool? Paul probably the greatest evangelist in the history of the world, who's just known for going around to love people and to care for people, is chained to a prison guard. All day. That poor prison guard. And he says that, because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Paul realized in that moment that God is the only true alchemist. He really does turn seemingly worthless material into gold. You know, as we're going through this season that nobody saw coming, at least in this big of a way, we're seeing God still turn things into gold. I want you to know that. I've been reading stories in the news. Have you? Have you read about what is happening to the environment through this coronavirus pandemic? Satellites are detecting that over China, and that in China, in some of the major cities, uh, nitrogen dioxide levels have dropped by 50 to 60 percent. 
They're saying, scientists are saying, we've never seen anything like this before. And you say, okay, well, good. Well, what's the point? What does that actually do? Scientists are predicting that if they were to keep this up, this kind of behavior, even after the pandemic ends, and keep it up for about a year, it could save up to about 100,000 lives. People that would have died prematurely because of pollution. God's working. God is making gold out of a seemingly worthless situation. Think about things that are even a little simpler. I'm getting calls every single day of someone asking, hey, is there anyone that I could grab groceries for? It's amazing. I want to tell you some things that are happening at our church right now. Back in the fall, our church felt like we were called to unveil this new mission that God was putting us on for the next 10 years. It's called 10 for 10. So at Lutheran Church of Hope, we've got 10 goals for the next 10 years. The first one on that list is to be an evangelist for Christ. And to, share his, to share his gospel, to get this, to 10 million people across the world. Specifically in the print, we have it said, broadcast the good news of Jesus Christ to 10 million people. When I first read that, I'm like, you're crazy. Don't put that out there for people to see. And what are we doing now? Churches all across the country, we can't meet together anymore in person. And so here at Hope, we're so fortunate. Here at Kairos, we're so lucky that we have the opportunity to broadcast. It's amazing. The people that are watching and hearing about this maybe wouldn't have heard about it without this pandemic. Not saying God used the pan- I'm not saying God put the pandemic on us, but I am saying God is using the pandemic to bring us something beautiful, something like gold. I've heard the predictions. I've heard the guesstimates. I mean, we can only really conservatively guess, but we've had more people tuning into our worship services over the last two weekends at Hope than we've ever had before. And that's saying something. I mean, 12, 13,000 people show up to our campuses in person when things are normal. Now tens of thousands of people are tuning in. I've heard estimates of up to 40,000 people watching on a weekend. How crazy is that? I've heard stories. I got a message on Facebook. I just touched my face. You see what happens? But I got a story. Uh, somebody messaged me on Facebook last night. and He said, you know, I shared the link to Hope's broadcast over the weekend. And I had a friend who messaged me and he said, the link that you shared might have saved, might have saved my life. Because he got to hear about Christ and it brought him hope in times that didn't seem very hopeful to him. I got a phone call yesterday. Someone said that they come to church and I see them at church, but they couldn't get their dad to come with them ever. So then when the, the, the service is broadcasting online, they kind of force their dad to sit there and like, all you got to do is watch the TV, dad, just watch the TV. The next week, he made sure that they were all in the room to watch. God is bringing gold out of this. And I want you to know the same is for you. Do you know what I really miss right now? It's Wednesday night. I miss you all. Take a look at these. I mean, I, I wish tonight looked like this. I wish that we were together worshiping here in Ames, in Iowa City. I wish that we were eating mini pancakes together. I wish we were talking, hanging out, cracking jokes afterward. We might be separated physically, but I want you to know you can still grow in that. And I want this to be very practical tonight. I want you to know that you really can grow in this season. So I'm going to bring Haley out here. Uh, If you've been a part of Kairos uh, in the past at all, you've heard Haley preach, and we're so fortunate to have her. Uh, She's our pastoral intern, but that intern is the most misleading title (laughs) in the world uh, because I think she does more than most (laughs) pastors have ever done, ever. Um, and, And so we're so fortunate to have you. But Haley, I want you to tell our students how can they continue to grow Um, in their faith in this season. Absolutely. Thanks for hyping me up, Danny, too. I appreciate that. (laughs) Such a great friend. Uh, But I'm so thankful for this time where we really do get to disconnect and connect at the same time. I mean, growth is important for you personally. I know for me, it's an important time to kind of step away and figure out how I can have this relationship with God and what this looks like in this new time. But also, it's so important that we're able to encourage one another, that we're able to build one another up. Because right now, it can feel like the world is crumbling around you and you're just hoping to cling on to something. And so at Kairos, we feel it is so important that we connect you with other people who are experiencing the same things, that are hoping in the same things, 
and can walk together in this new journey that we're experiencing as one family. And so we want to get you connected. And so one way to do that is on social media. We have links on our Instagram bio as well as our Facebook bio as well. And so if you click on that link, you can find out ways to get connected here at Kairos, even though you're at your home. The first link will actually take you to a picture um, of our YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel there. You can also click on the link and find two Bible studies that we're kicking off. They're going to be on Mondays and Thursdays from 6 to 7 p.m. So go ahead and join those. They're central time for those of you who are on different coasts. Uh, but we'd love to have you click on those links and join us during those times. They'll start next week on March 30th and April 2nd. So please get involved and get connected. We would love um, to get to know you more and study the Bible together. If you've ever read the Bible or if you've never read the Bible, that's okay too. We are, just want to experience this family and community with you because that's what this is all about. So go ahead. There's a ton more resources on that link and we'd love to get you plugged in. Thank you, Haley. Wherever you are, let's give Haley a round of applause for being Haley. And right now it's going to seem like I'm the only one doing it, but I know you're clapping wherever you are. And our crew. Thank you guys. There, there's a very small crowd of us in here. Paul says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Gold is showing up. And it kind of seems like at first glance, okay, well, Paul's happy because his circumstances are changing. It's more than that. See, there's something that happens when it's not just your base circumstances that are changing, but when you're changing. You see, God is in the business of turning things into gold, and as much as he would love to turn all of your base circumstances, it, circumstances into gold, I think he's much more interested in turning you into gold and to helping you see what no one could ever take from you. Think about the things that are being taken away from people in this season. I was officiating a wedding on Saturday morning, and in that picture is everyone who attended the wedding. That wasn't the plan. That's Danny and that's Alex. Danny was a part of Kairos, our first year of Kairos here in Ames. Now she uh, is a teacher down at Jordan Creek Elementary, and Alex will be joining her there as a teacher soon, too. They had all sorts of plans for this wedding. You know, your typical big American wedding. It's a party. And then all this happened. They weren't where they wanted to be necessarily. And so I kind of felt bad when I was walking into the building that morning. It's just empty. You know, the groom, God bless his heart, he's just going around, he's just trying to set everything up to make it as special as he possibly can. You know, there's supposed to be 100 people on each side. The beautiful thing about a wedding, I mean, it's... Every single person you've ever loved and every single person that has ever loved you is supposed to be in that room. So Alex, the groom, he comes and he stands in his place six feet away from me. And that little song from Up, the marriage song, starts playing. and It's really just playing on a little iPod speaker, iPhone speaker, iPod, 10 years ago. She's walking in. And it wasn't what they thought it would be. They were handling this in a way they didn't think they were going to have to. But let me tell you this, I've never, I mean never, seen a groom look at a bride like I saw Alex look at Danny. They could take their wedding away from them, but they could not take their love. And let me tell you this, this, this hit me pretty personal because a lot of you know that I'm engaged right now. I'm engaged to Abby, and we're supposed to be getting married in June, on June 27th. That's Abby and me. And like, we got engaged in December, and we're just immediately planning for this wedding. So excited, it's June 27th, and right now we're like, I don't know, are we gonna have that? Are we going to be able to share that moment with every single person that we've ever loved and every single person that's ever loved us? I mean, are we going to have that? What are these circumstances going to look like come June 27th? The truth is, right now, we don't know. I just read that the Olympics are going to be postponed a year. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's after the wedding. I'm like, this isn't what I had planned. This isn't what I thought. But you know what's cool? 
The wedding is a circumstance. Everyone keeps telling me, everyone keeps telling me, and it's a cliche, but it's cliche because it's true. When you're preparing for this season, don't just prepare for a wedding, but prepare for marriage. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool, but let's make sure we got the DJ lined up. That's fine, but let's get the videographer in place. All right, how are the venues looking? And now that that circumstance is uncertain, I'm reminded of what can't go away. The wedding is a circumstance, but whether it's here as we wanted it to be or not, it doesn't change the way that I love Abby and it doesn't change the way that Abby loves me. Now let me tell you this, infinitely more, God loves you. Infinitely more than I could, God loves Abby. Infinitely more than Abby could, God loves me. That doesn't change. Paul says this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, For I know that as you pray for me, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. My deliverance. Deliverance from what? It's not necessarily the circumstances. It can't be, because Paul had just said, I think I'm going to die. But in my suffering, Paul says, I've found the one who can never be taken. I've found the true love of my life. I've found my true foundation. He goes on and he says this, Philippians 1.21. You see, so now I'm finally realizing that living, if I continue to live, well, that's just living for Christ. But dying, that's even better. I'm like, whoa, oh, Paul, what are you saying? You know, don't get me wrong, he says, but for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. But get this, Paul says, even if my suffering got as absolutely terrible as I could ever imagine that it would get, even if I really did die here, well, I'd only be face to face with the love of my existence. See, for Paul, and for you, and for me, to live as Christ, and someday when we die, that will be gain. But there's only one reason why we can say that. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for you. He didn't. In John chapter 17, Jesus is about to be betrayed, and he knows it. And he's about, he's about to be handed over to the officials who are going to kill him, and he knows it. And he doesn't sit there and ask, how did I get here? How did this happen to me? Praise for us. I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them, Jesus prays, so that they can be made holy by your truth. See, for Christ to live, and he lived the perfect life, for Christ to live is for his own gain, but it would be for us to die. But for Christ to die is for us to live. However, he got there. He went through with it to be with you and to be with me. How did we get here? I don't, I don't know. But I know who's here with us. And I know who will get us through it. Trust him. Love him. Because he loves you so so much and they will never take him away amen
Thank you so much for joining us for Kairos tonight, you guys. It's, uh, it's good to be able to worship together, isn't it? Um, I know we're physically separated, but the Holy Spirit brings us together. The same God that's in this room with me right here now is the same God with you in your space right now. So now may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in his life and his peace now and forever. Amen. Sign up for those small groups, you guys. We can't wait to hang out with you. See you soon.